Today I'm going to be covering high spinal anesthesia during caesarean section. Now the South African 2020 to 2022 Saving Mothers report has uh, just been released and while we're still awaiting detailed analysis, uh, just over 2% of deaths were uh, deemed to be due directly to anesthetic causes. But in the last year of, those, of that triennium, in 2022, 4% were anesthetic deaths. And high spinals as a cause of, of maternal mortality continue to crop up. Um, and even though this is supposed to be a rare event, we're seeing them in the confidential inquiry when we look at these cases. So I thought it would be an important uh, topic to cover. Now, there are going to be two documents that I refer to uh, during this brief presentation. Uh, the first is this, uh, the Kinsella Guideline, which was published in Anesthesia in 2018, which is the, an international consensus statement on how to manage hypotension during caesarean section. And it's a must read for people that regularly do caesarean sections. Now, hypotension doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a high spinal. Hypotension is really common. It occurs in upwards of 70% of caesarean sections. And in more than half of the seizures you do, you'll need to give a vasopressor. So you must expect it and prepare for it. High spinal um, is not as common an event. It's a rare event. And it, the, the definition of it, of it relies on a high motor block. That's what defines a high spinal. So in this document, which was released um, in Sarja, it's a, it's a free download, and it's a context-sensitive guideline to how to manage high spinal anesthesia and obstetrics, we state that an Intrathecal anesthesia where a level of motor block ensues, such that cardiovascular and respiratory embarrassment develop, which seriously jeopardizes patient safety. So it's that high motor block uh, which causes the problems that we see. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about how we can potentially prevent high spinals, how we can detect them and critically detect them early, and how we can treat them. Now, like I've said, a, a high spinal relies on that high motor block, and the definition says that, that means above T4. Now, why is it that we get high spinals? It can't just be the dose. People always talk about the dose that we give, but there's so many other factors that can cause high spinals, and if we think about uh, what leads to them, we've, we've potentially got a, a chance at preventing them occurring. So there are drug factors. Uh, the amount that you give, uh, is important. In South Africa, we give, uh, we used to give a 1.8 mil dose of 0.5% hyperbaric bupivacaine. That is moving towards 2 mils now. That is the dose that's been used in the Western Cape, now in KwaZulu, and also in Gauteng. Now, at that dose, you shouldn't be seeing high spinals. That is actually on the lower end of the dose range internationally. And remember that it's the dose, not the volume, that's important. So we use a 0.5% a solution that means you're giving 10 milligrams of bupivacaine and if you look that up that is on the lower end of international dose ranges. The baricity is important, it's heavy marcaine we use so um, it's easier to control how that drug spreads but when you use heavy marcaine and you then put your patient in a head down position which is incorrect that can lead to high spinals. And just remember if you've previously given a spinal so you're repeating it or you've given an epidural that increases the likelihood of a high spinal. There are patient factors. People have always worried about high BMIs. Uh, there was some work out of Cape Town which suggested that this was less of a problem than we thought. So we tend to give the same dose in patients with high BMI. But obviously height uh, is a factor and you should reduce the dose that you use in a spinal anesthetic either below 1.6 or 1.5 meters depending on what you read. So under 1.6 I go to 1.8 mils and under 1.5 I sometimes drop to 1.6 mils of hyperbaric bupivacaine. And then another patient-related factor is positioning. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but you really don't want to allow your patients to be head down um, just after you've put the spinal in. And finally, there's technique factors. Um, so this relates to how we do the spinal anesthetic. Uh, one of the things you'll see um, recommended is that we use an Oxford wedge. This uh, is essentially just uh, putting a pillow in the correct position. So once you've laid the patient down, you put a pillow under the head, 
which allows the, the mother to flex her, her neck slightly, and this potentially pre um, prevents upward spread of the, of the local anesthetic, and I'll show you a picture of this just now. Um, barbitage, which is the practice of aspirating uh, when you're using heavy marking to see that there's CSF, and you see that little flashback of CSF when you do this. Um, excessive barbitage has been linked to high spinals. So uh, I'm not against um, practitioners doing this once, but don't do it repeatedly during your technique. The speed of injection, you must inject slowly. If you inject fast, potentially that causes turbulent flow and moves the, the hyperbaric bupivacaine kephalad. And then the, the site at which you insert, obviously don't put your spinals in too high. Uh, sitting the patients for a little bit longer, so once you've injected, don't be in a rush to lie them down. That may also influence the height at which the spinal gets to. Remember that the mark hand doesn't fix uh, for 20 to 30 minutes. So if you put your spinal in, wait 30 seconds uh, before you lie them down, and that'll allow that mark hand to settle and it won't uh, ride up the spinal cord. Just to continue talking about positioning, uh, this is a condition known as steatopigia, and as you can see, this is a um, in this position, this lady is lying uh, what she would call supine. But if we show the, the the bed as the black line and the position of the spinal uh, spinal column as the red line, you can see she's actually in a head down position. And so, if you were to inject a spinal anesthetic with heavy Marcan, the spinal would move towards the head in that direction. So what we need to do actually is to get that spinal column level with the ground. And to do that, we actually have to put the, the, the bed head up in this patient to get that nice uh, level spinal column. So when you put spinals in and then you uh, allow the patient to lie supine, you should walk laterally and look at the side of the bed and make sure that she's not head down. I think this is possibly the most significant factor that leads to high spinals is an unawareness that somebody's maybe tilted their bed head down or because of patient factor she is actually head down uh, in terms of the spinal column. Um, in all patients use a pillow and you can see this patient's got a pillow under her head and we sometimes uh, turn the, the pillow in, in its, on its long axis and then you fold the, the top third down and put that under the head and the, the bottom third goes under the shoulders. And that just allows that flexion um, of the upper part of the spinal column which prevents the, the heavy mark and moving kephalad. And so this, this is a vital piece of equipment. We should do it in all patients. So if you want to think about ways that you can prevent high spinal, assuming you use the right drug and the right dose, in the right patient. Inject slowly. Minimize your barbitage. Don't rush to put the patient supine. Let her sit for 30 seconds, then lie her down. Make sure that the bed level is appropriate to keep the spinal column at least level. Sometimes that means the bed needs to be slightly high up, uh, head up. Put a pillow for the patient's head, and then once you've done that, be constantly vigilant sit and watch the patient. It's, an, it's absolutely critical that you pick up that the level is climbing too high early. Now I've said this already that hypotension doesn't equal high spinal and that's why it's worth reading this, uh, this guideline. Uh, there's the reference for you so you can go and get it. And I'm going to just uh, mention some of the principles that come through in this guideline as we carry on. Firstly, when you're trying to differentiate between spinal hypotension and high spinal, remember that in both cases, the blood pressure will go down. Typically, it goes down more dramatically in a high spinal because you don't get that heart rate going up to protect the cardiac output. So the heart rate classically goes down in a high spinal, where it goes up initially in spinal hypotension. And the reason that the heart rate does not respond with a high spinal is that this, the spinal level has gone above T1 and the cardiac accelerator fibers are between T1 and T4. So once those are blocked, then the heart loses its ability to generate a tachycardia, which is supposedly going to help us with cardiac output. So the a dramatic drop in cardiac output typically um, follows a high spinal. And then the motor level, which you can test, it's going to be T4 with spinal hypotension. It's going to be above that level with a high spinal. 
And the easiest way to quickly check is to get the patient to squeeze your finger with her hand. And squeezing a finger requires that T1 uh, is intact. So when they aren't able to squeeze your finger, you already know the motor block is too high and you should act accordingly. Now, with both conditions, the first treatment that you do is to give vasopressor. And I can't stress enough that when you're not sure, you should just give the vasopressor. We shouldn't be scared to give vasopressor. So you should give it if the blood pressure drops below 90% of the baseline systolic that you measured in theater. If the heart rate goes up by more than 20%, give the vasopressor. If the patient is feeling nauseous or is vomiting, give the vasopressor. The number one cause of nausea and vomiting during a seizure is hypotension. If the patient becomes confused or drowsy, give the vasopressor. And if you aren't sure whether you should give the vasopressor, you should probably just give it. So have a low threshold for giving it. Now the one caveat that I have with high spinal is that if you've got a patient with a bradycardia, that vasopressor should be something which increases the heart rate. So ephedrine would be a more appropriate choice than phenylephrine and sometimes even adrenaline is the right choice. But if you're not sure, just give the one that you have available because the number one thing you need to do is get that blood pressure up. So in that uh, article that we've uh, written in the South African Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia, there is a table on how to diagnose high spinal. And really it, it goes through the what happens progressively in each system. Look out for patients that say they are dyspneic, complaining of shortness of breath, if they say they feel weak or if they lose their ability to speak or respond to you. Those are very, very worrying signs during cesarean section. And in particular, if the heart rate is going down rather than up in response to hypotension. And then quickly, quickly assess the patient. Get them to squeeze your finger, get them to move their arms, um, make sure that you're not dealing with hypotension and move quickly at this point. Don't wait until the patient is unconscious. Early recognition of a high spinal is absolutely crucial. It's critical to the management because at this point you're going to be asked to manage a number of things simultaneously. The first is that you've got to respond to a low blood pressure. And so the first action you take is to give a vasopressor. That vasopressor should ideally be something that raises the heart rate if the heart rate is down. So that would be ephedrine, 10 milligrams, or even <clears throat> if the patient is peri arrest adrenaline. So a one milligram amp in a 10 mil syringe and you give one to two mils of that, that's one in 10,000 adrenaline. Or take that milligram and put it into the, the, the fluid bag of either one liter ringers lactate or 500 mils of a colloid like voluven and just run it as an adrenaline infusion, a makeshift adrenaline infusion. You should do that quickly. Then you should allow the fluids to run in generously. So open up whatever fluid you're running and run that in quickly. We prioritize the treatment of the blood pressure because the hypoventilation, the lack of breathing that occurs is usually from midbrain hypoperfusion. It's from low blood pressure. It's not actually from paralysis of the diaphragm. To paralyze the diaphragm, you must be at C3, 4, 5 level. Actually, that's very difficult to do even with a total spinal. So that feeling of breathlessness that they get is from intercostal paralysis. But if you keep the blood pressure up, often they can carry on with diaphragmatic breathing. So get the vasopressor and the fluids in, then provide airway support. Now remember the key here is to ensure ventilation. So this can start with positive pressure ventilation. You can just take the ambu bag and ventilate the patient. The urgency is to get the blood pressure up and to get some oxygen into the patient. So ventilate with 100% oxygen. You may then need to secure the airway and you can do this either with a supraglottic airway device or with intubation which i'll come to now but the key is to get the ventilation going while you're treating the blood pressure and don't forget to call for help this table will take you through the details of each of those aspects of management just a point on securing the airway if you've treated the blood pressure and you're able to mask ventilate the patient, you've actually got the situation under control. But it may be that you need to intubate the patient 
And if you need to do this, you shouldn't be using big doses of propofol or even thiopentone. You can do this with a small dose of etomidate. You can use the anesthetic gas, isoflurane or sevoflurane. And you may need to use a muscle relaxant, but you may also be able to do it with just those, those agents. Remember, this is a hypotensive bradycardic patient. So big doses of an intravenous induction agent are contraindicated. Finally, what I want to um, reinforce with you is that once you've put in a spinal anesthetic in, that is the time to really, really, really pay attention to the patient. So watch the patient, not the yellow form. Don't be filling in your anesthetic form just after you've put the spinal in. Give the patient time to sit, lie her down, get the pillow under the head, get the wedge in so that you've got the appropriate tilt. Walk laterally on the bed, ensure that she's nicely supine, not head down. And then be vigilant. Watch her, talk to her, make sure she's not having any symptoms. And it, it, generally I advise that you get to the point where the baby is out, you've given the oxytocin, and you've seen the response to the oxytocin. And that's the first time I'll start to relax in the cesarean section and start to fill in my uh, anesthetic form. Obviously the next thing to watch out for is bleeding. But in terms of the spinal complications, you're probably through the woods once you get to that point. So, so pay attention to your, your patient. If you respond quickly to a high spinal, it's actually not that difficult to manage. And the ones that we get into trouble with are the ones where it's been missed for too long. And the first thing you notice is when she's had a cardiac arrest. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Thank you very much.